Hey everyone, welcome back to Chat Cemetery. I am joined by Drew Deitch, and today we are talking about a book that is not written by Stephen King, but it is The Making of Creepshow 2 by Lee Carr. And this is a pretty big book. When you look at it, it doesn't seem that big, but because of the size of the book, Drew, I think this contained a lot more words than you and I were both expecting. (laughs) Yeah, well, I I mean, I have certainly read my fair share of making of books uh, before. And, um, you know, we we did the episode on Creepshow 2. And when when you made me aware that this book was going to be, I was like, yeah, I would like to know about the making of that movie because I haven't. I, I believe there's a documentary that was made for one of the DVD releases at one point. Um, so I mean, there has been some kind of notation on the making of the movie before, and a little bit was like, yeah, it was a really troubled production in the sense of like they had a lot of location shooting that was affected by weather, um, budgetary mm-hmm. reasons, stuff like that. Like that's kind of all I had known, and then this book came about that, that you alerted me to. I was like, yeah, I'd like to know it. And so I, we can talk about some of the stuff in the actual story of the making of the movie if we want. But this book, I think, was a really good example of why I, I don't often read nonfiction. Um, I, okay. And, and not that I dislike it. It's that you recently read, uh, I, I know, uh, the, the Jaws Log by Carl Gottlieb, which is yes. about the making of Jaws. And for and and for me, that is a good example of, yeah, that's a nonfiction book, but it still is structured in a way that it feels like a story is being told. Mm-hmm. Like it is narratively captivating, regardless of the fact that it's a log about something that really happened. Um, and that is kind of a key thing a lot of times with nonfiction for me is like, you know, I kind of still want to feel like I'm reading a story. And this book is not structured in that way. Now, I I don't want to knock Lee Carr and what he did because as a record of the inception, production, release, everything of Creepshow 2, you couldn't ask for anything better than this book. Like, it's it's exhaustive in that. Yeah, with exception of, I think he was saying in the introduction he didn't get as many people from the makeup department as he would have liked yeah special effects people because of previous experiences yeah well because he had, he had written a book about the making of day of the dead and you know another thing that was produced by romero's company as was this and apparently some of what the the fallout of making that book meant that he did not seem to have as much access to special effects interviews for this book there's still plenty of that covered in, in the book. I mean, again, for him to not have access to that big of a chunk, this book still is going to, I mean, it'll, it, it will take an aside because he was able to interview, you know, like the first assistant, assistant AD or something. <laughs> and he has to kind of like give a synopsis of their life story, um, you know, before they're and, you know, how they got into the movie business and things like that. Yeah. And it, and it's like, look, I'm I'm glad that you got to, you know, meet these people and, and record them and something. But the book as written really reads like a log. It and, and part of that's because so much of it is him taking. He's like, look, I've got call sheets for every day and, yeah. you know, all this kind of stuff. So. It's a very exhaustive tome in the sense of this is what happened when Creepshow 2 got made. But reading it doesn't feel like you're reading the story of Creepshow 2's making, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I would tend to agree with that because I found myself getting very tired (laughs) while reading this because of the fact that, like you said, it's what happened every single day. But it really felt like it was presented as here are the facts as well as anyone can decipher them. Mm -hmm. Because it also felt like this movie was made with the minimum required organizational skills in order to get it done. Well, there's I mean, as a troubled production, you you know, they go into the facts like, look, you know, the the first the 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 assistant director or the first ad was fired like you know a couple weeks into shooting 
Um, the the one narrative that I found interesting that he tried to weave throughout the, the book that actually was a story is the fact that they did not have a lead actress ready to go for the hitchhiker sequence. And yeah. while they were in production, they were trying to, to get somebody in that role. And for whatever, you know, at one point it was going to be the, the big uh, section of that story is when it's like, oh, we got Barbara Eden, you know, like, you know, I, I Dream of Jeannie is going to be in this. And then mm-hmm. she had to. Uh, pull out because of uh, uh, health issues with her mother. And, and again, they're like, we're in the middle of production and we're trying. So, you know, we have to reschedule and shoot everything that we can that does not require this part. Um, And it's like, that's a, that's an interesting conflict filled tension filled story right. to tell is like, we're in the middle of making this movie and we don't know if we're going to get an actress to play this part. But that, that's an example of like, yeah, that's really the only kind of, through line narrative that feels propulsive in the book as opposed to like all right here's day here's day 29 yes this is another day where it says the weather was really bad so they had to reschedule shooting on stuff and as a document this is incredibly impressive and i'm glad it exists like it's great to have this kind of documentation and like you say a a report that seems to do its best at minimalizing its editorializing is mm-hmm. like, yeah, it's it's nice to have that. And I'm glad right. that exists. But I would also want this almost kind of totally rewritten so that it flowed like a story as opposed to just a collection of facts and documents and interviews that don't really tie together in the best way. Yeah, and because it was going in order of when things happened, everything was out of order, you know, (laughs) in Mm -hmm. a sense, because things don't get filmed in order. So I think personally, I maybe would have liked a format of, okay, here's what happened for the raft. Here's what happened for the hitchhiker and have that all grouped into one. Sure, yeah. Because of how it jumped around so much, I was like, wait, wait where did this part leave off? You know, like when they were doing the raft stuff in Arizona Mm. and then they were talking about post-production in London, like way later, I was like, hold on. Okay. (laughs) You still have to kind of put the pieces together because of how far apart certain things happen in the film production process in general, Mm -hmm. which is no one's fault. Like he chose to lay it out this way for a reason. It is what happened in chronological order. But for me personally, I think I would have preferred things grouped together by segment because then, you know, you also had Holt McCallany who clearly talked to Lee for hours upon hours about creep show too. Oh, I mean, there's, I mean, well, and that's the thing is that books like this, I understand if uh, as somebody who has an interest in whatever the movie is that's covering a big thing that you really want is less the words and more the pictures, mm-hmm. you know, it's like and you want to see and and this has a treasure trove of behind the scenes and different types of stills. But then it'll also have like, here's me and Holt McCallany going to a, a, a Pirates baseball game, like because I became friends with him and I'm like, cool, that that's great. I'm happy for you. This doesn't f- like feel necessary to to the story yeah. of the making of creep show too but i'm glad you guys are friends or, and go to baseball games together like that's cool i've 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 no you don't have any heat with me for that but i don't know if it belonged in the in a book about creep show too <laughs> it's it's more of again and that's why it feels more like a log it's like this is lee kerr's log of his experience trying to piece together the making of creep show too it just doesn't turn out to be as interesting a read when you structure it like that. Because I, I, I think of this is very off off base, but it's just the example I think of. And it's very unfortunately dark is um, one of the nonfiction books that I absolutely was riveted by is Columbine. I can't remember the author's name now, but it's just called Columbine. And it was a very uh, popular book on the subject. And it's because he structures the the story of what happens like it's a story like we're you know experiencing what these characters were experiencing on these different days and the lead up to that and it reads like just a good story with characters and stuff and and has a very clear mood and tone and everything 
And this, I think that's such a big deal with this is because of the way it's structured and the way it's executed. The tone of it is all so cold. You know, the, as much as it's very clear that Lee Kerr loves the Creep Show 2 as a movie mm-hmm. um, because he will directly say it, the vibe of the book is just very, very coldly journalistic. Yeah, it's very matter of fact. And to your point, one of my favorite nonfiction books in a similar vein to the one you mentioned is In Cold Blood. The way that sure, is yeah. told is like a story unraveling as these true events are happening. And I don't mind that there is a log of Creepshow 2 by any means, but I feel like when you're going to do a making of book, because I have a lot of making of, art of books, and the way that, like the Alien one, for instance, the making of Alien, is formatted is it seems to be telling a bit more of a story. Now, I haven't read that whole book, mind you, because it is much chunkier than even this one. So I just haven't had the time to sit down and consume that whole thing yet. But they have parts of the script that are more legible than the paperwork that we see photoed in this book. Some of them were just Mm. so small, I was like, I'm not going to struggle to read that because one other note the font in this book is pretty darn small it's very very tiny well and again because a book like this i understand the real draw are the pictures Mm -hmm. like it's really every pretty much every page has something an image of and and to this you know books both credit and i think what makes it so tough to really ingest is like they will go down to like, okay, we're going to talk about this letter that was sent from the Laurel production company talking about potential directors for creep show two. And we're going to print the, you know, reprint the entire letter, you know, photocopied into the mm-hmm. book. And it's like, okay, cool. Like that's a document. You, you you have documented a very specific thing about this project. That's cool. But okay. <laughs> like, I yeah. mean, especially, I mean, like I, I, I don't want to totally dis, on that aspect because it also has all the stuff you would want like i like that because yes the way that he's formatted it is there is really the book is really one very long chapter it's broken into like four chapters technically like four or five sections and the biggest chapter is the actual production of the movie which takes up i want to say like three quarters of the whole book that sounds about right it's big but then he has a chapter that is specifically just about the animation crew that did all of the animation segments in Creep Show 2. I think that was my favorite chapter, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and for pictures, it's like, oh, I love stuff like this because I love seeing, you know, the key art and cell art and, you know, Bible drawings where it's like, okay, here's this character's, you know, range of expressions. Yeah. Here's their color. I just like that as a fan of animation. I love seeing that kind of behind the scenes stuff. Um, so that, that section had all of that. It had so much of that. And it's like, oh yeah, I just like, I like that a lot. Um, you know, and, and during the production science, like, yeah, you'll see plenty of behind the scenes, you know, you will see behind the scenes makeup stuff, but a lot of it is like, here's a call sheet to back up what I'm saying in this part of the book or like, you know, here's so, so much of it is like, yeah, you went above and beyond. I think what anyone would in terms of trying to, make a complete record of the making of creep show too. And that's great. And I'm happy it exists, mm-hmm. but I I would like to watch a documentary on the same subject and see how they make a narrative. Cause just like you're saying, I would assume if there's a documentary about this, it would go by, okay, we're going to focus on the old chief Woodenhead segment and tell our stories about that and what happened during the production of those elements. Then we'll go on to the raft. Then we'll go on to the hitchhiker, you know, that kind of stuff here with it, just trying to lay out the, the actual day by day of production. I think it's like for people who wouldn't know anything, it is a really good peek behind the curtain of low budget genre filmmaking of the time. And certainly, I mean, it's a, it's a pitiable production because so many bad things happened to them. Like, like, you know, they weren't able to make the sequel with Warner Brothers like they did the original. They ended up with New World Pictures, Roger Corman's outfit, which was then deciding to get out of 
theatrically distributing the movie after, you know, they had gone into production, you know, they were, they were ensured that it's like, oh yeah, we're going to, you know, have, you know, have the theatrical run, but then it started to like disintegrate and they're like, ah, I don't think it's going to, maybe we're not going to do that. It's like that. They, they definitely had a very, very tumultuous production. And that part of the story is interesting and worth exploring, but the way that it is doled out in this book is very, very difficult. It's very difficult to latch on to any particular narrative of what's going on in the making of the story other than like, well, I guess that was the day that they focused on one, you know, it's like the, this day they had George Kennedy shooting a bunch of stuff. So I guess I'll just interject my George Kennedy section that I wrote where it's like, here's George Kennedy's biography and who he is and stuff like that. And it's like, yeah, yeah I just think you're, you're, you're doing a good job at like, like you said, presenting what you believe to be the best factual representation of what happened during the making of creep show too. But in the process of doing that, I just don't think that Lee Kerr was able to tell a good story about the making of creep show too. Yeah. It felt like it was just sort of missing a little more humanity to it. Maybe it was very much so like, here's what happened on this day. I, I think his, I mean, obviously he had access to so many interviewees and, and wanted to get everybody in there. But at some point, I think that you need to be judicious with that. Like in all honesty, it feels like he printed just a lot of whatever he was able to get from his interview subjects and did not edit down more than he probably should have mm-hmm. because he wanted to represent them properly and wanted to, you know, thank them for being interview subjects by, you know, giving them as much profile as possible. You know, if if that's the case, you know, I'm just in, insinuating here. But as such, it's like, yeah, OK, I'm, I'm glad these people got spotlight. But it's it's kind of in, in it's it's instead of having like a story going on, he's just kind of let, letting everybody kind of tell their little stories here and there, whether they have any connection to something larger going on in the production at the time, you know, and, and as such, it's like, yeah, it's nice to hear from so many different people and get so many different perspectives. And it's very clear that Lee Kerr wants to credit as many people that he possibly can, whether that's by interviewing them or like in the animation section, I remember he says like, well, if you look in the actual credits, there's, you know, like, four names or something for the animation. But here's really as many of the people that I could see that really worked on the animation segments. Mm -hmm. And it's, and and it's like, okay, like, great. I I totally support that mindset of like, you want to credit the, you know, the, the people that should be credited, totally back that up. But that mindset then kind of permeates the way that he's, he believes that he's telling the story of the making of the movie where it's like, I just want to get everything and everybody out there instead of kind of editing it down and editorializing it more to make it flow like it's a story. But at the same token, this is like, if you ever wanted to know anything about Creep Show 2, I have to believe in some form or another it's in this book. Yeah, pretty <laughs> like, much. It is very I thorough. hope it would be. <laughs> I hope it would be, um, because it is, a, it is a lot of book. Yeah, and despite the fact that there is so much information in this, I don't really have a whole lot to say about it. I mean, if you want to know as much as possible about what happened behind the scenes with Creepshow 2, then this is the book to read. Just go into it knowing that you're not going to get this crafted in a way that tells a story from start to finish. This is more a factual account of what happened from day one to the final day. There were many days, (laughs) there were many things that went wrong. And, you know, there's a ton of content in here that there are a ton of things in here that I just had no idea about, honestly. So if you're curious in that regard about what happened with Creepshow 2, then yeah, sure, pick this up. I will say, though, I do have a couple notes on the way the book was printed, which is very nerdy, very specific, I know. Oh, please. But these pages are so shiny that if you're trying to read it with a light on, you have to like angle the book just right 
to be able That's to true. see what you're reading because the pages are so shiny and there's so much glare on them at times. And I did notice that the little, you know, like laminated film over the front and back cover of the book has started like peeling up. It's already yeah. where my hands were placed for the majority of the reading time of this ah. book. So, you know, it's like on the, the edges on the bottom by the spine and where I would like open and close the book. So obviously that is not necessarily the author's fault. That is just, you know, choices were made when printing the book. Sure. And this is clearly a much, you know, smaller, I'm sure, publishing oh, yeah. outfit. And, you know, this is it's because it's such a because it's such a sizable thing. I'm sure it's like, yeah, you need to print it on on particular cheaper product um, to to because because of one, I'm sure, you know, I, I, I hope this did well because a little just, you know, our own personal backstory of just trying to get a copy of the book. It's like it took us a while because yeah. it looks like. Because we ordered it and it looked like they did not, or, you know, order enough uh, copies for the first printing or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like, well, I hope the book did well and everything like that. But it is. It's also like this is it feels very much like a niche collector's thing, which is fine. Uh, I would say if if you're curious about how movies really get made and you really kind of want to dive into the deep end. In terms of specificity, this book does cover that. It's like, yeah, you will know, you will learn things about the production of a low budget movie. Yeah, I was going to say, especially a movie with this type of budget, because, you know, I was saying how I have the making of Alien book. That was obviously a much different production and a much different budget level, (laughs) you know? So I think that with books like this, and look, those were just a couple things, especially the glossy pages that kind of made the reading experience a little more difficult. But I understand why they did it. And it's because of how many images are in this book, because usually what happens when you have a book that's kind of like this is you'll get like a book that looks like a novel, but then it has, you know, those glossy pages slotted in throughout the book, especially if it's like a biography or a memoir or something. Mm -hmm. So you'll get those glossy pages specifically with a bunch of images, just like usually placed in the worst spots. Like they don't even place them in between chapters. (laughs) They just do it in the middle of the chapter. And I'm like, excuse me, I'm in the middle of a sentence and you're giving me pictures. (laughs) (laughs) That's a whole other nitpick though. But overall, I think... I'm in agreement with you, Drew. It is a bit of a tough read. It's very, very dense, and it will take a while, even though the book is technically under 300 pages. It felt like it was twice as long, just given the size of the book and the pages and the size of the font. Like That combination of those things just made it seem like a very long read. And, you know, I don't regret having read it by any means. No, no. This isn't really something that I'm like comfortable rating, though, because like it is a nonfiction telling of what happened, you know, (laughs) like, yeah, I I didn't I didn't rate it on Goodreads because it was like this isn't normally like even though it's a movie and a genre of movie and I'm interested in the, you know, the making of movies kind of thing. This really isn't a type of thing that I read often and especially in this format where it's like it's not, you know, because I've read nonfiction books about film like um Easy Rider's Raging Bulls, which is the story of the Hollywood New Wave. It's like, that's a great nonfiction book and, um, you know, structured well because it follows a a very particular timeline and and presents this overall big story, which has hundreds upon hundreds of players in a cohesive manner and tells a story. Like, it feels like you're reading the story of something happening because, yeah, like you're saying, the pages, the font, the the size of the font, the way it's compressed, everything. Yeah, that doesn't help the reading experience, but it's also for me a big thing of just like, yeah, it just didn't feel like I was reading the story of the making of Creepshow 2. It, it really feels like I was reading the the progress reports on the making of creep show too. And again, I'm not against that method or or that being out there as as a record of of that kind. Um it's just not something that, I, that I'm normally going to be excited about reading because kind of the pure facts element is like okay, it's it's nice to know those things, but if I'm reading something, I really want to be reading a story. And um 
the story aspect of the making of creep show two as a as this book really isn't there but if it is just like yeah you want to flip through and like look at some of the cool behind the scenes photos and 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 production stuff i love that yeah. in any you know making of book it's like yeah i love seeing that kind of stuff and to get something that's for so niche of because it's like yeah you of course you lord of the rings or star wars or whatever those are always going to have their own you know very heavily curated very you know uh, marketable types of books out there from those but to have something for as niche of a movie as creep show 2 that's this you know, overly descriptive uh, of things, both in its words and its visuals. It's like, yeah, I'm super happy that this, that, that this exists and this is out there, Yeah. but reading it as a, you know, f- from cover to cover as a thing is like, nah, I just like, skip around to the parts that interest you the most. If you are you know, like, I was so thrilled to get to the animation section. Finally, same <laughs> um, af- after that huge production thing. So I'm like, Oh, good, thank God. It's just a change of pace and like a change of discussion. And I like looking at all of this. So it's like, yeah, I, I, I don't even know if it's necessarily best utilized as a cover to cover reading thing it's like no it's just best to open up and be like yeah like here's this section of or like of uh of some cool behind the scenes art or oh yeah here is this section i I just need to look up because i remember them saying there was some some issue with the car like like basically the next time i watch creep show 2 i will i will think about things (laughs) that i will half remember from this book of like oh yeah i remember there's some like they ended up trashing the hero car accidentally there was like some problem with the car they were renting and you know if that's a fun thing that you like to have in your brain like i do then it's like yes absolutely the making of creep show 2 is great but um yeah no just a, a definitely a tough experience reading but overall a a an educational experience and the making of creep show 2 and just in kind of how to construct the story of a, a movie's making yeah so if that if any of that's interesting yeah i i would recommend it if but again it's so niche that I have to imagine that you and I are some of the only people who would read the making of Creep Show too. <laughs> well, on the off chance that anyone else wants to pick it up, I'll have a link in the show notes to make that a little easier for you. And I think there are still copies that are easier to get now that they've done, I believe, a second printing of it. But yeah, this was one that is going to go back on the shelf and it'll probably come back out at some point if and when I decide to rewatch Creep Show 2, and I'll just be like, oh, yeah, what was that thing that I am half remembering, like you said? Right. <laughs> yes. It'll, it'll, it'll be a nice little annotation guide mm-hmm. of, you know, it's like, oh, right, I remember this going on. Okay, great. Yeah. And, you know, I have a ton of these making of art of books again, and I I don't think I've ever sat down and read one start to finish, but I do have a big book that is the making of Cujo. And I think I also have the making of Christine, but those look to be more like novel sized. So I am going Mm -hmm. to be very curious to see how those kind of compare to something like this, because this, while it's not a hardcover, like a lot of the making of and art of books that I own, this feels more like a coffee table kind of book in paperback form yes a hundred percent yeah it's it's very coffee table whereas the other ones i have are just like your regular you know six by nine books or whatever size they are i don't actually know five by seven whatever the normal like paperback size is but obviously it's not going to be a one-to-one comparison because those might not have nearly as many pictures or something. So true, true. it'll be interesting to see. And those also are very long. So it may be a minute or two before I get to those. I think I also need to find <laughs> a guest for one of them So <laughs> still. So that's in the pipeline, though. You guys will all get those episodes at some point. But Drew, thank you so much for plowing through this book with me <laughs> and doing the episode. Happy, uh, there's nobody else I'd rather do it uh, do it with and do it for, Deanna. It's, uh, happy to do it and always glad to be on the show. Yeah, and I'm sure you will be back for something that it may or may not be anthology related again. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. All right. Thanks, Drew. 